All right, it's great to be with everybody. After after quite a while of meeting, this is our last meeting, as this is the end of season two, and we're anticipating season three, just talking about it coming out in theaters, perhaps, and uh, some way where we can see it. We're picking up where we left off last week. We're in the middle of uh, episode eight of season two, and I'm going to backtrack as we start. It's about a half an hour. Uh, if you're if you're joining us and you're or you're watching this uh, again, you guys, we're going to start right about at the 30, 30.4, 30 30.5 minute mark. If you're watching on the internet, you can easily find that cue on your TV a little bit harder. Uh, And why I'm back, backed it up just about three, maybe four minutes from where we stopped last week is because this is the lead in uh, with Matthew to the Sermon on the Mount. So I wanted to recap since this is the you know the, the grand finale for season two, obviously focusing on the Sermon on the Mount um, because there's an important I, I didn't think of it uh, think uh, to go into it pretty in any detail last week, but there's an important understanding about the Sermon on the Mount, the words that I think that we almost always get wrong, and there's a better way the, the the way this is is um presented in the chosen is is very well done um i i can't remember if i have the i can't, i don't think i did include it. let me see hang on a second let me see where I'm... let me i we're going to queue it up i'm going to queue it up in another place but uh, when we get back together we'll start right there and i hope to see everybody in just uh well you're watching it then in about 30 minutes. All right. Tell me what you thought. It was nice to see Matthew actually smile. <laughs> you know, he was happy and he, you know, when he was so emotional, it was unusual when Jesus was, you know, referring to him as the salt of the earth. Yeah, it's starting to that big foreshadowing happened there with that uh, new guy that was yes. being introduced to the group. Yeah, I think everybody probably watching is like, "Oh, that's oh, okay." <laughs> as, soon as, he, as soon as he said that, everybody watching would react the same way. Like, okay, yeah, got it. Been waiting for him to show up. <laughs> right, and he's so yeah. sincere now. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, remember now, um, strangely enough, that's that's a wonderful way to put it, Sharon. But uh, so strangely enough, I don't think I'm not sure that Judas's sincerity has ever been in question. Mm-hmm. Um Remember that when he, so the, so the back, with the background that we know about Judas and the way that Judas was, uh, the way that he, he comported himself. So he went to the, the temple to do something about, uh, about Jesus. And their response was that they just wanted him to be taken in for questioning and want it to be a low pressure, low stress thing without the the opportunity for violence because Jesus had so many followers. So, you know, when, uh, when they took him and, and uh, condemned him, of course, Judas's reaction was to go back to the temple and, and make us and demand that they that they undo what they've done and you know throw the money back at them and then he hung himself mm-hmm. so his the reasoning for him to do what he did was because he believed that something was supposed to happen and that and that god was going to do something and that jesus was just off track he, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do to fulfill the pat the, the prophecy and he thought that by getting the temple involved to push this ball down the road, that whatever was supposed to happen would happen, that Jesus would 
would react and everything would just snap into place. And the, uh, the, the, the temple authorities just threw them a, a ringer. You know, they said they didn't, uh, they implied one thing and they did something else. And it was not his intention for Jesus to be taken and, and killed. So, you know, I like that the portrayal of him here, that he's in the midst of a, uh, the beginning of life that is corrupt, you know, a shyster, taking advantage of other people's lack of understanding and lack of knowledge, the, the, the salt mine, the salt field uh from that guy stealing it from that guy basically and and in the in the face of getting wealthy and and all this with this um very uh sophisticated flim flam man as a as a as a uh, mentor uh he's got the whole life in front of him of ease and and luxury and and he can't there's a there's a true spiritual draw for him to find the place where God's intersecting on earth and that it's, it's a life. This is a, what he's saying is this is the, this is a life I have to live. I have to live out the something that's more than this. Even if I get rich, it's not worth it because that's not true life. I have to find the true life. You see how they're brilliantly weaving the, the story together with the beginning with the uh, with the salt of the earth we saw last week and then jesus um when he is with matthew who's critiquing his sermon and uh, remember if you remember last week matthew criticized or <laughs> he, he he critiqued jesus and said you're saying some really hard stuff here and that whole salt of the earth what is that and it needs an opening and that's why in, when we started tonight, Jesus came back to him and said, I've got it. I've got the opening, which is the Beatitudes. And that's why after he said that very nice thing to Matthew, Matthew then said, and then what? <laughs> and he said, salt of the earth. Right. So it all, the Beatitudes flowed into this place of uh, this foundational place um, where this being the salt of the earth will make everything different will make everything new and that's why he went oh yeah because he got it you know that was his idea basically saying yeah you need better lead in um so judas has always been i think in fact they did a wonderful job of portraying judas in the jesus christ superstar um where he he dies you know, I don't necessarily like that whole scene, but at least they, I think they dealt with him fairly. He, he dies and then uh, his spirit is rising up and he, and he has that whole song where he's saying, why me? Why did you do this to me? You know, why did you make me the eternal bad guy? Why did you make me into the villain? You know, it's, it's not fair. I'm not a villain. I'm not the bad guy. And I thought, okay, that was, that's, that's pretty good. So the question has always been, I mean, it's a question you may want to, that you ask is, is, did Judas go to hell? And a lot of the middle writings, uh, certainly in the United States uh, during the 50s and 60s, the answer, if you read the commentaries, is always yes. Of course he did. He went straight to hell. He betrayed Jesus and, and he's in hell now. He's rotting away in hell, burning in hell like this. Uh, I don't think so. The early, the early uh, church doctors didn't have that opinion universally. Because again, look what he did. His, his betrayal of Jesus was not absolute. It was such, he was so filled with remorse about what he did that he took his own life. It was just, it broke him. And the life that he was going to live with that sin as a part of who he was, he couldn't live. He couldn't do it. There was so much grief and and sadness and horror in him for what he had done i can't believe that uh that that god would not forgive him that especially when jesus is hanging from the cross saying god forgive them you know and he's talking about the 
the Roman soldier who could care less and who just nailed him physically to the to the tree. And he's still asking God to forgive this person, where Judas was obviously racked with guilt and and horror in this thing. So uh since sincere. Yeah, I think that you're exactly right. He he appears very sincere. I, th I think he was. And he had a conscience with the man. Right. <coughs> yep, absolutely. So, I always wondered, excuse me, I always wondered since Jesus could see inside the hearts of his disciples, how he uh, kept Judas with him. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of written about that too. And it's, it is that, um, so it's so nothing is is contrived right the the, the incarnation is not contrived it's not set up so god didn't set it up this way rather uh the incarnation evolved or or became uh, what it became simply because it had to the people involved in his life um, for all the right reasons, we're going to lead to this outcome. And Judas came to him for all the right reasons. He came to him for all of the goodness and the truth and the wonder of all of it. But the, the horror of the crucifixion came not because of Judas, but because of the, uh, the sin and the corruption of the 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 next ring of people the the sanhedrin the the temple authorities the romans um judas was a catalyst at that time but there would have been another catalyst if not judas and judas didn't again come to him for the wrong reason judas came to him for the right reason and g and what is um what does jesus say uh, uh, all that my father has given to me have come to me and I will in no way cast them out. So Judas is one of those. He's not being cast out. He's not, he's going to set in most in, in motion that the end event, but uh, because that's the way it has to be. It would have been the end event it, no matter what. It was just Judas that became the head of the pin. So, yeah, how could he? But now remember, too, that Jesus said, so we have that Jesus is not, uh, he is fully human, you and I, same, same. Fully divine, because he has the, the nature of God. Uh, as a human being, he's without sin. So being without sin, he is a catalyst for the Holy Spirit. So we are all catalysts for the Holy Spirit. We all um, gotta sneeze. We all have a the relationship with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit flows through us uh, to interact with others and and is interacting with ourselves. So you may have had this experience with somebody else. You may have given this experience to somebody else and not even know it. So you're you're in a pay in a place of pain or in a place of fear or something, and somebody in your life um, was this person to you that comforted you, that that healed you, that brought you back, and in that in that experience of that person, you felt something more than the person you were with. You felt uh, a. Uh, a closeness to God that was emanating from that experience, from that interaction. So we all have this ability. The Holy Spirit manifests through us because <clears throat> of our willingness to relinquish ourselves to God in the moment. And that way God can act and interact through us. But we are all clogged up with sin and brokenness. So the, the action of the Holy Spirit's a little bit and it's sporadic. I used to I used to use the the, uh, the image of a of us literally as a as a straw, right? And that 
kind of working in reverse. The Holy Spirit would, could come through this straw and out to the people, but our, our straw is all clogged up. <laughs> it's all, you know, this big tube for the Holy Spirit to go through is a tiny, you know, pencil hole that sometimes is completely clogged and it just nothing gets through. Well, Jesus has got the same straw, but his his straw is completely clean, like Teflon clean. So the Holy Spirit can flow through him unimpeded because he is he he is he's holy. So when he looks into the hearts of the people, it is the catalyst is the Holy Spirit working through him and the Holy Spirit acting in the other person that makes this person's heart known to him. He's not being, you know, magical God man who reads your mind because he's God. He's not doing that. This is again why Jesus said the same thing I'm doing, you can do. And we all read that and go, yeah, right. I'm not God. I can't do that. But he's saying this is not dependent on me being God. This is actually dependent upon me being human. The Holy Spirit's flowing through me as a human being. As God, I don't need that. As God, the Holy Spirit is me. The Trinity is one. We're all together. The Holy Spirit flows through me, and in the same way, the Holy Spirit can flow through you, is flowing through you, but can flow through you more and more as you clean out that tube and make your life accessible to God's Spirit. So it is that awareness the Holy Spirit is giving to Jesus as he interacts with the Holy Spirit in other people. Um, but again, if you're having this interaction with the Holy Spirit, then I know, or he would know, or you would know, that, that the, the emanation that he's receiving from the Holy Spirit, uh, if that person's heart is in the right place, if the person is doing the right thing, even if you know that in a little while they're going to blow it, right now, in this moment, the Holy Spirit is saying, this is a blessed moment. So remember, Jesus said, only live in this moment. Don't live in the next moment. So that's why Jesus said, I, I, may, know the, I may know what's going to happen in the large scheme because it has to happen. You, it has to happen because the sin and brokenness of humankind is going to overpower the, the opportunity for, for blessedness and, and divine uh, communion. That's just what's going to happen. You're going to blow it. Just like... Um, I, we didn't we didn't recover that one section. I was trying to find it, but at the very beginning of that practice session with Matthew, if uh, you may remember this, it's kind of funny up in the hill, and Jesus was saying, you know, practicing, and Matthew said to him, "Well, you know, uh, why do you have to say why do you have to do this anyway?" And Jesus said, "Oh, yeah, why? Because you guys are doing so such a great job. It's really worked out well, hasn't it?" You know, a little sarcasm there, you know, like I like the like the humor they stuck in there. So it's Jesus knows what is needed because he knows who we are and he knows what's going to happen because he knows who we are. So he knew this was it was going to happen. This thing it was all going to go bad. Um, that was that was foretold, it was foreseen, it was foreknown. But in the moment, he's not living. He's not living today with Good Friday. He's living today with today. This is the moment. And that's why it says to us, you know, you have to live in the moment. You can't live in yesterday and you can't live in tomorrow. You have to live right now. If you live, we know this from a psychological, emotional standpoint, we're frying our brains. But from a spiritual standpoint, you see how it's so much more important now. If I'm, if I'm talking uh, with Alan and we're in this moment of pain or if the need for comfort, or the need for a commonality that's deeper than the skin, that we're, and we're looking for God's interaction, and the only thing I can do is concentrate on how ticked off I am what happened three days ago, and how angry I am, and, and how to, it's going to ruin the event five days from now, I am just clogging that straw up completely. I am shutting down the spigot. It's just not going to happen. I won't be consoled. I won't be connected. Alan's over here, He's calm, he's doing the right thing, and he is emanating the power of God. 
Holy Spirit's just like flowing right through them, not through me, because I'm not living in the moment. I'm not connecting with the Holy Spirit in Alan. I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to interact with me. I am all in the past, and I'm all in the future, and I'm bopping back and forth between. And Jesus said, you can't do that. You can't do that. You, you have to live in the present. If you don't live in the present, you can't connect with, this, with the Spirit this way. It's only living in the present when you connect with the Spirit. It's vitally important for us living in the moment and not living in the past and not living in the future. We, we, can, we can remember them and we can anticipate them. We can't live there. The living in either one of these will steal the moment, steal the present. There's no present for us. There's only a regurgitation of the past or the tense fear of the future. And in that, in this middle, there's no, the, the straw is all clogged up. So Jesus lived in the moment. Jews came to him for the right reason. Boom, he's all in. All in. Yeah, that's, that's where it is. And you could argue, too, that the it was the moment of the revelation of God's spirit for Matthew that then broke his heart and drove him, drove him to this place of, of self-awareness and then the loss of that same awareness that drove him to the to the tree where he where he killed himself because he couldn't accept the uh, the forgiveness of god in the flesh and so he had to end his flesh so let's let's stick with that for a minute and get don't want to take all the time here but let's take this for a minute because i wanted to replay that little bit about the beatitudes because the Beatitudes are so often misunderstood, okay? Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, for they will receive God, for they will see God, you know, for the kingdom, for they will receive the kingdom of heaven. The problem is that the word uh, blessed um, is makarius in the Greek. And makarius in the Greek, when you say uh, uh, blessed are the... For they will, no, no, no. Macarius makes um, blessed into like a transactional uh, a word. It's a transactional event, right? Uh, uh, blessed are the people that do this because because you're blessed, you're going to get this thing. You're going to receive this. So blessed is the, are the pure in heart. And because you're in pure in heart, you're going to get this thing. You're going to get to see God. So it, it's a, it's a, transactional event that's taking place transaction you do this i do this that is not what makarius means in the greek makarius in the greek translated is um let's see if i can change the word um, okay so it, the way we usually say it would be um if this is, makes a transactional if we did it if you are blessed uh, uh um um no bless it you you will be blessed if you are pure in heart for you will see god for then you will see god okay that's not it it's rather um when you are pure in heart you are blessed to see god how's that Macarius is a word that basically denotes a state of being, not a, something that you're doing that's going to produce a transactional end, a new thing. It's a state of being. So what Jesus is saying to the people, and they would have gotten this because they would have the word Macarius and they would know what he's saying. It, it's oh gosh, it's the it's the um, it's the it's the divine Mobius strip. Everybody know what a Mobius strip is? It's the it's a figure eight. You take a, a we did this in elementary school. And we've all forgotten it. They would put, give you a piece of um, of uh, construction paper like fourteen inches long, and then you take the construction paper and you twist it one full time, and then you pull it around to a figure eight and you tape it together. And then if you put your finger on it and you follow it, it goes all the way around and you come out on top. And then as you go through, you go back, you go to the inside, you go to the inside, then you come out on top, and it never ends. 
So you're going from the outside to the inside to the outside. Um, M.C. Escher made a beautiful um, um, sketch of a Mobius strip with ants on it. And the ants are going forever on the Mobius strip. <laughs> it never ends, right? So a divine Mobius strip uh, is, is, a, is a, a principle or a theological statement that we can travel on forever. Forever and forever and forever. So for this, for this word, uh, um, so I am searching for God. I, I'm searching for God, and I'm searching by, by eliminating and by purifying myself because I believe that's what God wants and, and, and asks me. Well, how am I able to overcome my own sin to do this? Well, I can't, but I but I can because I'm searching for God, and because I'm finding God, God has aug augmenting me. God is blessing me. God is helping me, and in my in God helping me, I rely more upon God, and I am purified more, and God helps me more, and I rely upon God more, and God helps me more, and so my purity is actually happening because. I have found God and God is finding me. And as since I am living now in this state of relying upon God and loving God and receiving the blessings of God, who do I see? God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Not if they get pure in heart, they're going to look, you get a reward. It's almost like I'm pure in heart and then God goes, woohoo, I'm here. And then... <laughs> That was my reward. I got to see God. No, it's not that. And, and because it is a state of being, once I get to this place of pure in heart, that's the way I'm living through everything. Through the death of my mother and the, the party and the, the ticket and the broken arm and the bankruptcy and the car accident, all of these things I'm I'm still seeing God because I'm living in this place of pure in heart because God is blessing me because I'm seeking God. You see, it's a Mobius strip because it never ends. It it is a relationship that continues to live through and on itself forever and for always. So this is the truth with all of the beatitudes. It's a it's a state of being when the people seek after God then this thing that they are living into will be part of their life. It's not a reward. It becomes a natural outcome of who they are. So next time you listen to the, the Beatitudes, don't think about it like, dang it. <laughs> I'm, I, so many people I've talked to, dang it. I just, uh, I guess I'll never see God <laughs> because I can't get pure at heart. I can't do it. I'm trying. Oh, yeah, this is like the I drive down the freeway and the guy cuts me off, and I'm like, not pure at heart, not at all. And so I guess I'm out of luck. I just that's so sad. It'll never, I'll just never have it. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. It is it is a state of being in my quest for God. God augments my quest and, and the result of the life that I am fashioning with the partnership of God is that I will see God, not just God like face to face, but God in everybody else's face, God in every moment, God in every opportunity, God present all the time, everywhere. That's the core of the Beatitudes. Okay. Um, all right. And the second one I just wanted to tell you about, and I want you to, to, to jump in here. The remember, remember the little parchment they were hanging up on the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I looked it up. I found the translation and it basically said, come and see Jesus, the, the, the master, the teacher. Uh, and then it says, um, on the hill of, uh, Chorazem. Um, and that's it. So that's why it was really short. Jesus, the teacher, uh, preached teaching on the hill of Chorazin. So where's Chorazin? Why Chorazin? Chorazin is only mentioned once in the Bible. It's mentioned in Matthew, or uh, yeah, Matthew 11, 21. And this is what it says. This is at 20. Then Jesus began to criticize openly the cities 
in which he had done many miracles, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! If the miracles done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago with sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, and then he goes on. So what does that mean? Well, it's interesting because he's doing, he's going to, um, uh, he's doing the Beatitudes here, right? So he's staying in, in a Chorazin, outside of Chorazin, on the hill of Chorazin. So we know that there are going to be miracles taking place in that town. and that. And that the the uh, uh, this event of the of the people coming for the to hear him speak, there's going to be a mirac miraculous happening here. But from this exposure to Jesus, all this effort for people to come, all of this stuff that he's doing is not going to produce any good thing in Chorism when this is over. It's going to be the opposite. So. That's going to have to come back later on. Has to. Can't believe they're going to stick that up on the wall and then just leave it away. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> nothing there. All right. Uh, what else? What else? Tell me what else. How about that blue and purple thing? Yeah, it was interesting how he just wanted to keep it simple, but I felt like there's definitely some symbolism there. Yeah. Yeah. And I like how with every single one of the attitudes it flashed to one of the disciples. Right. And in there, I think, I feel like the circumstances that they represented the beatitude that he was stating, I think it wasn't just random pictures of them. You could tell it was in that, from the past episodes when they were acting in that way. Yep. I thought it was interesting the way they portrayed all the preparation that went into it, that I, I never even considered it, mm -hmm. that Christ was preparing his remarks. Matthew was critiquing him. The disciples were working to get everything organized. I never really thought about any of that. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought it was extemporaneous. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're doing a really good job of of, of um, showing a real transitional ministry in Jesus, uh, rather than what we're used to. Like in the in the in the uh, the past, when we've shown the videos on um, last year at in Lent, and I the one where they're where they're doing this, you know, and, and Jesus, they're all like all over the hill. And Jesus is just sitting there on a rock, staring out at the people. And people are just kind of looking at him like, is, is he going to say something? I can't wait. I mean, you know what he's going to do. He's going to just stand up and start. Wow. And people are going to listen. Oh, my gosh, he's speaking. <laughs> um, whereas if that doesn't make, that image doesn't make any sense. And we bought it hook, line, and sinker. I mean, we're living that for our entire life, right? Jesus' ministry is transitional. It's it's changing everybody around him and he's building a team. He doesn't, he's never treated them like I'm the grand poobah and you're my little peon. So go get me something to eat. You know, he is saying all along, I'm going to make you fishers of people. I'm going to teach you. You're going to be my, my team. And we're in this together. We're not separate. We're not different. This is again, the, the downside of this, where he's saying, like the sermon last uh, last week, they're gonna they're going to um, hate you and revile you, and some of you they're gonna kill. All for me, and he said it here: when they hate you and revile, revile you for my name's sake, then rejoice, for your reward is great in heaven. Um, why would they do that? Because we're a team. Why would you do that? Because we're a team. So to think of him being portrayed, Jay is Jay saying. Um, you know, working it out with Matthew. <laughs> and you know what's happening. What is he doing? He's bringing Matthew out. He's bringing Matthew along. He's Matthew's this little turtle man. He's all in himself and kind of like this. And he, 
he's so socially stunted that and Jesus is just bringing him you know reaching in there and pulling all that person out so he can be the person that he's supposed to be you know now, I, I even when I watch this I'm wondering they really are making it like Jesus really needed Matthew to do this I'm, I'm thinking I guess that he would wouldn't he if that was part of the ministry that he is, is embarking on and the team building that he is making that's necessary for him, then he does need to do this. Yeah, it's, it's great. I, I really appreciate that. It makes me feel like I'm not, you know, when, it's, when I'm having a moment and I'm like, durr, durr. And then I finally get it. I'm thinking, Jesus has been there the whole time going, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah. But, you know, that was, a, that was a really neat way of doing it. Yeah. Pulling like behind the scenes kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> we know the, well, most of us know the stories, but this is more of the background to those stories. Right. Yeah. As, as, some people have interpreted Dallas Jenkins. Yeah. With the human touch. I liked um, I liked the same thing that they did in the, in this one. Oh, if you noticed uh, that they did in I can't remember the episode. It was when um, gosh, who which episode was it where he where he finally oh was it uh, it was the it was the uh, shoot. The episode where he where he performed a miracle, the people knew about it, and Peter said, "It yeah, happening now." And he said, "Yes." And, and he was like, "Yeah." Oh, that was that was the water at the well, I think. Was he's it? Saying, he's saying now it's time, and they all started marching towards the city. I think. And when he and when he started walking, his his face changed. He went from this kind of yeah, this is good to that real kind of okay, this is it. And when he went from um, walking through the disciples to climbing the steps to go out on the stage for the five for the five thousand people there, that his look changed. Yeah, it went from I'm I'm not sure what I'm going to do if I'm going to make it okay to absolutely this is exactly it. And that's so yeah. so well. So his confidence well. increased just as he was walking. Because what's right and good and true is right and good and true. Mm -hmm. We don't need to second guess that or doubt it. And we're open to the Holy Spirit. We'll be told that. And we won't have to think back and second guess it at all. Yeah. <sighs> all right. Well, it looks like we made it through. And, uh, Sharon, we'll have to talk about that idea. I mean, when is that supposed to happen? This uh, release to the, is it January or something? Uh, no, it's tomorrow. Oh, really? I, really? Thought it was, I thought it was coming out in 23. No, not in this. This is just a movie theater. Um, episodes one and two they're showing. Maybe, oh. are they, uh, I don't know where I heard it. I had thought what? that releasing that's, until 23 so that's amazing i did not know that well it's almost 23 and um this is like a preview people get a chance to pay and go see it yeah i, I saw it the guy was talking when i when i turned on um to catch up from what we missed last week okay the, the guy you know and he also said that there's seven seasons <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> I mean, that's I what he it. said yeah i thought yeah. I there's eight oh. it's gonna take a really long time to film wow and if they have budget yes they have budget they will get the money that's not that's wow but there's I... a chance for me to buy tickets i have no idea so you know you click on the icon on uh <laughs> icon on um you know your chosen icon and the guy will, I think, 
will probably say that you'll go to a, a page where you can buy tickets. It'll show you all your local theaters that right. are when and what time. And I'm pretty sure the 18th, which is tomorrow, yep. was one of them. And then every day for I don't know how long it'll be. So it may not be showing for a long time. I see it now. Look at it. A uh, website called Fandango, and it's right on here starting Friday the 18th. Yeah. Oh. One at Regal Virginia Center, Regal West Tower, a whole bunch of theaters in the Richmond area. Uh, Atlanta. That's a no idea. whole bunch. Multiple right, times each day. I'm going to stop this real quick. Friday the 18th. But it's seasons one and two? No, it's season three. three. Episodes oh. one and two. Oh. Episode one and two, the season three. Okay, okay new season. Season three begins in theaters November 18th. There's a little thing on there. Let, Just me, go to go and, and let me let my let me let anybody who's watching go. Um, <laughs> and watch you guys uh, hope to catch up with you when we do something for season three. Hopefully something uh, um, together on the internet, and then we can be together again. Well, I'm gonna go see it pretty soon because I don't know how long.